Armin Mivas was a sexual sadist who found cannibalism the means by which he could express his sadism. Of all horrific killings I've come across, Mivers is there right near the top of all the killers because he actually got someone to sacrifice themselves, someone to be slaughtered and eaten. When I think of Armin Mivers, the slaughter, the, the killing and the whole case, it is unique and probably will never again be seen by a coroner. In December 2003, the trial of Armin Mivis sent shockwaves throughout Europe and around the world. The 42-year-old computer technician was accused of brutally killing and eating another man. But was it murder when the victim had apparently been a very willing volunteer? Mivis had broken the last taboo. I'm here in Germany to see how they dealt with the internationally famous horror story, The Cannibal of Rottenburg. I'm Fred Dynage and I'm investigating murders that have shocked the world. I want to know what motivates someone to kill and to find out how they think they can get away with it. To local villagers, Armin Mivis seemed the perfect neighbour. But how much do we know about what goes on behind closed doors? Armin Mivis was born in 1961 in Essen in West Germany. He was the third child of his mother, Waltraud, and the first child of her second husband. At the age of three, Armin's family bought a manor house here in the tiny hamlet of Wusterfeld, near to Rottenburg. It's a big place, 36 rooms, and it was bought as a retreat. It was in the heart of West Germany, and the locals here were to be horrified and confounded when, 36 years later, they realized what the young boy had done. Gisela Friedrichsen is a journalist on the respected German news magazine, Der Spiegel. She's been following this case very closely. Tell me about Armin Maivas as a child. He was the youngest of three sons. The two older sons left the family very quickly. So Armin Maivas remained the only person for his mother to focus all her attention on, especially her bitterness towards men. She directed everything at Armin. She monopolized the child. She called him Minchin. Minchin, which is a German girl's name. He had to do everything. He had to do household jobs, he had to go shopping, he had to take care of her. Wuschterwelt is a small village with only 25 inhabitants and there were few children. Neighbour Manfred Stuck remembers Armin Mivis as a young boy. Manfred, when did you first meet Armin? Da war ich noch kleiner Junge. I was just a small boy when Armin and his parents came to Wusterfeld. Armin's parents had bought a house in Wusterfeld, and that's how we met, because there were no other boys of the same age other than me. Armin had a horse, a white pony, and it was called Polly. During the Easter vacation, summer vacation here in Wusterfeld, he would go around with the carriage and the pony, and we would drive into the forest together with Armin, the pony, and the carriage. In September 1970, here in Wusterfeld, Armin Mivis's happy family life effectively ended. He was playing in the garden with his friend, Manfred Stuck. They heard the front door slam. Armin's father came out, climbed into the family car and drove off. Armin ran after him and tried to stop him. He failed. His father had gone. How much did his father leaving home affect him? When the father left the family, he was deeply shattered. The family was broken. His entire world had fallen apart. Nothing was the same as before, and he could not deal with the new situation. 
Armin's interest in cannibalism was ignited at the age of 10. Robinson Crusoe awoke his fascination, and as a child, he would spend hours watching butchers cutting up and preparing meat. Leading criminologist Professor David Wilson has been studying Mives and his obsession with breaking the last taboo, eating another human being. So why and how would these images of cannibalism, these, these sort of dreams of cannibalism start? What would actually provoke that? Just loneliness? What seems to have driven the trigger in relation to Mivas's fantasy of cannibalism was his reading of the book Robinson Crusoe, which of course has a crucial scene in which uh, Robinson Crusoe is going to save Man Friday from cannibals who want to eat Man Friday. So Robinson Crusoe and Man Friday become best friends. So he wants to he wants to place um, some kind of relationship at the heart of his life, which is about him and him being valued as opposed to him being abandoned. Literally, he thinks, by consuming someone, it's a way of keeping them close to him, of having them permanently with him. In January 1981, 19-year-old Mivis left home and joined the West German Army. He became part of the 52nd Armoured Infantry Battalion in Rottenburg, just outside of Wuschterwald. He wanted to be a professional soldier. He wanted this to be his career. And he spent 12 years in the armed forces. He was surrounded by young men who stimulated his mind and imagination, where he felt comfortable. And there was normality, a normality from the outside, that stopped him from pursuing his fantasies any further. It also gave him power over other people for the first time. And according to Mivas, it was a way also of controlling his cannibalistic fantasies. Now, during this period when he's in the West German army as a, a non-commissioned officer, as a volunteer non-commissioned officer, he does seem to have developed friendships with women. There was one particular woman that he had developed a friendship with, but this didn't go anywhere. Did he ever mention girls, girlfriends? I had a girlfriend. We went out together. But Armin, no. When we were soldiers in the barracks, he asked me if I thought he was gay. Armin, I said, you have to know that for yourself, I said. I cannot look inside your soul. I don't know what you're attracted to. And actually, I always thought he was. Armin Mivis had failed in a normal relationship and his career in the army had turned sour. He found solace in alcohol. One Christmas, he got very drunk, he crashes his Mercedes car, and of course being drunk and crashing his car leads to him losing his driving license. And then once Mivas gets his driving license back, he crashes his car again, having been drink driving. Mivis's drunken behaviour destroyed any possibility of a long-term career in the army. And in 1993, 32-year-old Armin Mivis left the army and returned to Wusterfeld, where he looked after his ageing mother. He completely took care of her and he changed his career. He became a computer expert and found employment as a service employee in a company that maintained the computers of large banks and similar institutions. He did that during the day and in the evening he took care of his mother until she fell asleep. Germany was changing. The Berlin Wall fell in 1989, reuniting East and West Germany. And then in the 1990s, something perhaps even more dramatic. The commercialization internet and the World Wide Web. Suddenly Armin Mivis was able to communicate with the rest of the world. If you think of yourself as being a fully realized cannibal by the age of 12, you must think of yourself as being very pathological, very unusual, very unique. Suddenly the internet allows him to realize that there might be other people out there who have the same interests as him. One of the things for me has always been about how fantasy lives of offenders can emerge out of fantasy 
into reality. How do you make those fantasies that you have become real? And what happens once you do so? The internet bridged the gap between Mibis's fantasy life and reality. He constructed websites and doctored photographs of young men who could be butchered. Mivis was moving closer in fulfilling his desire to be a cannibal. Er hat aus he shaped the meat from animals into objects. He formed human bodies from marzipan and slashed them open to make it look realistic. He manipulated these images on the computer to make it look as if he was working with real dead bodies. And he was very successful with this and sent out many of these images over the internet. On the 2nd of September 1999, Armin's life changed forever. He returned home from work to find his mother lying in her bed. Waltraud Mibis had had a heart attack and was dead. Armin had discovered a new found freedom. He was now able to lead his life by his own rules. I'm here in Germany re-examining the case of Armin Mivis and the first crime of cannibalism in Germany. By the end of 1999, Mivis had discovered a new love for technology. With his domineering mother out of the picture, he was free to indulge his fantasies on the internet and pursue his obsession with cannibalism. It's the bridge between his fantasy life to become part of his reality. His mother dying allows Mivas to take these fantasies to the next level. And literally by November 1999, two months after his mother has died, there, it, there is no trace of his mother in the house at all. He can therefore uh, give free reign to his computer skills to advertise on contact groups to find a suitable victim. In the year 2000, 38-year-old Armin Mibes began his search for like-minded cannibals and willing victims on the internet. He placed adverts on websites and forums seeking volunteers, looking for his slaughter victim. Criminal psychologist Dr. David Holmes knows just how unusual the case of the cannibal of Rottenburg is. Why is it considered taboo in, in many countries? This is sort of a, a very difficult question. Um, by taboo, we mean that it's societal pressure to stop you doing something. Clearly, you shouldn't breed with your own uh, family due to problems with genetics. Similarly, it's not in evolutionary interest for us to eat each other. In the majority of cases, often eating other humans will actually produce diseases, uh, particularly brains, and those diseases, presumably, are designed to stop us doing it. Cannibalism, is it more common than, than we think, or less common? In the case of um, situations such as criminal acts, such as the case in question, um, it's actually fairly rare. However, in cases of war, where cannibalism is quite high, um, as is rape, um, this is often covered up and it's often not documented, even though it does happen. So it's actually more common in conflict situations. But in terms of general public criminal acts, it's actually very rare. Armin Mivis posted adverts looking for a handsome young man between 18 and 25 years old. Pleasant and physically appealing, but also not too muscular. When no one in the specified age group replied, he raised the age to 30. And then someone did, Jörg Boser. That's a uh, contact become. So, uh, this was the first time he had contact, real physical contact, not only virtual, but real. And Jörg offered himself to be slaughtered. I think it was also a game for Jörg, until the moment came in which everything became a serious reality, and then. He said no. And from that moment, Mivas was not interested in him anymore. Well, it was part of Mivas's fantasy that the victim agreed and wanted to go through with it, that the victim wanted to be killed so he could eat them. 
Jorg Boser had changed his mind, but this didn't stop Mivis looking for another victim, a willing volunteer. He would take photos of himself holding butcher's knives. He even made papier-mâché heads and would saw off a mannequin's body parts and hang them from the ceiling. Mibis wanted to show potential victims what he was capable of. The final person to respond to Mibis's internet message was Bernd Jürgen Brandes, a 43-year-old bisexual engineer. On the 14th of February 2001, he contacted Mivis, volunteering to be eaten. They discussed the best ways in which his body could be consumed and what should happen to the remains afterwards. Brandis even suggested his skull could be used as an ashtray. Burnt Brandis was suffering from a very extreme type of progressive masochism. He wanted to cut off his penis to amputate it. This idea was his ultimate thrill that he dreamed of. He didn't care what happened after. But he wanted this male penis. He wanted to get rid of it. Obviously somebody who wants to be killed by another human being is clearly in some way dealing with underlying mental health problems. Those underlying mental health problems might be structural, they might be long term, or they might be a response to some temporary crisis in that person's life. They may be depressed, they may have difficulties at home, in their relationships, at work. So clearly we're not dealing with somebody who is um, very healthy at that particular moment in time, we're dealing with somebody who's vulnerable in one way or another. And that's the crucial thing. You know, these internet forums allow people who are vulnerable to think that there's a solution, which is not to go and see a psychologist or a doctor or a psychiatrist, but the solution might be to do something which in other circumstances they wouldn't do at all. Bernd Brandes message to Armin Mivers was entitled simply dinner in it he wrote I offer to let myself be eaten alive no slaughter but eating therefore whoever really wants to do it needs a genuine victim on the 9th of March 2001 Bernd Brandes met Armin Mivers at Castle Station Brandes is going to hide details of their meeting from his partner, Reni Esnick. Um, he's going to say that he's going on a work trip. He's also going to remove details from his computer in terms of the email correspondence that's gone on between himself and Mivas. And he's also going to uh, buy a ticket, a one-way ticket from Berlin to Kassel, where he's going to be picked up by Mivas. Armin Mivis drove his willing volunteer, Bernd Brandes, back to his home in Wusterveld. When they arrived, Mivis went to the kitchen to make them some coffee. When he comes back to the sitting room uh, where he had left Brandes, Brandes is completely stripped naked and says, according to Mivis, I want you to admire your dinner. And so again, we're getting some indication about um, their fantasies, but we're also getting a sense of underlying that cannibalism is the psychosexual desire of them uh, that, that they have of one person being totally dominated by another. Bernd Brandes told Mavis he would like to be unconscious when he was slaughtered. Brandes swallowed half a bottle of cold medicine, telling Mavis that when he was sleepy he could castrate him. But half an hour later, he changed his mind. Mivis drove Brandes back to Castle, but the fear of returning home and explaining his actions to his partner, René Jasnik, forced Brandes to change his mind again. This time, it would all be recorded on video. He says, look, if I go back to Berlin, there'll be a confrontation. It would be better for me if I was completely unconscious, then we could go forward with this particular fantasy. They bought sleeping pills and a strong cold medicine, and they drove back. And then the amputation happened. They first tried to cut with a kitchen knife, and that didn't work very well. 
So then they tried it with a sharper knife. The penis was severed. Then both of them wanted to eat it, but they couldn't because it was too chewy. So Maivas fried the penis, but it didn't taste as good as he imagined it would. So Brandis is now slowly dying. What does Maivas do? Brandis says to Maivas, according to Maivas, that he would like to be placed in a bath of warm water so that all the blood would pour out of him because he's getting cold and if he's in a bath of warm water it would be a, a, a way of more quickly ending his life. So Maivas places Brandis in a bath of warm water and sits next door reading a Star Trek novel. Uh, whilst he hopes that Bernd Brandis is going to die. After two hours, Brandis called out for Mivas. He'd got out of the bath and collapsed on the floor, unconscious. Mivas picks him up and takes him to a bedroom. And according to Mivas, Brandis says, if I'm still alive in the morning, we will feast on my genitalia. Don't dream of calling uh, an ambulance. By 5 a.m. on the 10th of March 2001, Bert Brandis was dead just 17 hours after arriving at Mivis' house. Mivis then cut up the rest of his body in the same way he'd seen butchers dismember the carcasses of animals when he was a child. Later on, he pulverized the bones to get rid of them. However, he kept the head. And in the following days, he started to eat the rest of the meat. Because he found the meat was pretty chewy, he minced the meat and made meatballs from it. He turned it into a real event. He videoed the cutting up of the dead body, and then he repeatedly watched this tape. Armin Mivis had butchered Brander's body and placed it in the freezer. On the 12th of March, 2001, he ate his first meal a fillet with a pepper sauce. Over the next year, Mivas consumed 45 pounds of Brander's flesh. He had fulfilled his fantasy. I'm reinvestigating the case of the cannibal of Rottenberg, Armin Mivas, and the events that led to the death of Bernd Brandes here in Wusterfeld. By March 2001, Mivis had brought his fantasies to life. He'd become a cannibal. 43-year-old Bernd Brandes from Berlin had willingly volunteered to be eaten by the 39-year-old computer technician. Within 17 hours of meeting each other, Brandes was dead. Bernd Brandes does have a partner, Renny Jesnek, back in Berlin, who's trying to find uh, Bernd Brandis. He hasn't returned from this so-called business trip. He's disappeared. The police are trying to find him. But remember, Bernd has been incredibly careful about destroying any evidence that might link him to Wusterfeld and to Armin Mivas. So ultimately, Mivas is going to be caught, not because of the steps taken by Reni Jesnik, but is going to be caught by the fact that Armin Mivas isn't satisfied with having eaten one victim. He wants more. The death of Brandes had not satisfied Armin Mivas' obsession with cannibalism. By June of that year, he was back on the internet, looking for more willing volunteers. Mivis also put pictures on the internet of what he had done because now he was a hero amongst the cannibals. He had done it. He had killed a human being and eaten them. The others only dreamed about doing it. They only imagined it. He had actually done it. And this triumph, he didn't want it to be taken away from him. He was the hero. Often when I've worked with paedophiles, their knowledge of computing is far in excess of the knowledge of the criminal justice system's knowledge about computing. And so I get the impression of uh, Mivas feeling rather pleased with himself. He can advertise for even more victims and has therefore not tried to hide because he doesn't think he's going to be caught. On the 8th of July 2002, Reinhold, a 23-year-old medical student, discovered Mivis's advert 
while surfing the internet. He was shocked and decided to contact Mivis to find out more. At first, Mivis must have thought that Reinhold was going to be another willing victim, whereas in fact Reinhold got Mivis to admit enough detail for Reinhold to be particularly concerned that what had taken place was a murder. So Reinhold is going to alert the authorities, he's going to report a crime having taken place, and that's the beginning of Mivas being brought to justice. On the 28th of November 2002, the District Court of Rottenburg issued a warrant for the residence of Armin Mivas in Wusterveld for suspicion of presentation of violence. The police turned up at Wusterveld, searched Mivas's house and stables, took away samples from the freezer, samples which would include body parts of Bernd Brandes, of course, there was also the video of uh, the slaughter itself, although the police didn't originally uh, find that particular video uh, in the collection of videos that Mivas had in his home. They arrest, nonetheless, uh, Armin Mivas and interview him and question him. Despite an extensive search, the police found no evidence and the results weren't yet back on the meat from the freezer. Armin Mivis was released. His neighbour, Manfred Stuck, believes there was a motive behind Mivis's next move, his confession. Armin met a friend, a woman. Maybe he wanted more from her than just friendship. He wanted to confess the crime and take responsibility before pursuing the relationship. So he went to a lawyer and said to the lawyer, well, I did these things. What's the best way to get out of this? Then he went to the court with the lawyer, told the judge the same thing. And the judge said, for now, drive back to Wusterfeld and wait there until the police arrive and then see what happens next. Mivis never denied that he did it. He also said that he knew it wasn't right, but it happened because Brandes demanded it and Brandes wanted him to do it. Brandes wanted to be killed. Mivas was not interested in the amputation of the penis. He only did it to, let's put it like this, to get Brandes to a point so that he could kill him. Mivas was only interested in being able to cut up this person, to get his meat and eat it. On the 10th of December 2002, Armin Mivis was taken to the Regional Criminal Inspector's headquarters in Bad Hirschfeld. There, in a five-hour interrogation, he gave the police full details of the death of Bernd Brandes. A visit to his house the next morning provided the police with all the evidence they needed. Professor Manfred Riese, a forensic pathologist, discovered the contents of Mivis's freezer. What tests did you do? We received different pieces from the house. They were doing excavations on the property. They found parts of a skeleton, the head for example, the disembodied hands and disembodied feet. Well, that was one part. Then there were 35 bags of frozen meat. We unpacked the bags. How much did you have? How much was missing? Only soft tissue was missing, which Mivis had eaten. The whole skeleton was there, so we could definitely say that we had one single person in front of us. So how much of Brandes' body had Mivis consumed? Mivis said about one third. Brandis weighed about 90 kilograms, meaning he consumed about 30 kilograms. This could be confirmed with the help of the remaining parts. Armin Mivis was arrested and taken to Castle Penitentiary. The meat in his freezer had been formally identified and the relatives of Bernd Brandes were informed of his death. The video filmed by Mivis during the whole process had corroborated his statement to the police. Is it possible to imagine the pain that Bernd Brandes would have been in? When Brandes' penis was cut off, his alcohol level was 0.8 to 1.4 millilitres, and he'd consumed only a few drugs. He was scarcely narcotized. 
The pain while cutting off a penis is a so-called sense of impending doom. The strongest pain that can be inflicted. It was seen in the video and also heard when he screamed loudly for a period of two minutes. On the 3rd of December 2003, Armin Maivez went on trial here at the district court in Kassel. The cannibal of Rottenburg pleaded guilty to the assisted suicide of Bernd Brandes almost two years after his death. Maivis was questioned in court about what he'd done, and he reported it so eloquently and in such a silver-tongued manner. He played to the audience, to the cameras. Basically, what he did there was narcissistic. He used the court as his stage. Cannibalism is defined as the non-consensual consumption of another human being. In Germany, as in most countries around the world, it is not illegal. The courts wanted Maivis for murder, but as German defense attorney Gero von Pelskazim knows, without a motive, this was a hard task under German law. Tell me, first of all, why this Maivis case was so complex in German law. Well, the, the Maivis case is a very u unique one. We had cannibalism cases before that. People who have been in an uh, emergency situation and killed someone uh, to survive. This case with Maivis was kind of special because here you had two people with kind of very strange motives for people like us, I would say. Explain to me, if you will, the difference between murder and manslaughter in German law. In German law, yes, it's a very um, difficult uh, difference. So, like, um, murder is uh, in the criminal code in section uh, 211, and it says a murder is whoever kills a human being out of murderous lust to satisfy his sexual desires from greed or otherwise base motives, by stealth, or cruelly, or with means dangerous to the public, or in order to commit or to cover up another crime. And manslaughter is uh, all killing without these uh, severe uh, spe specialities. Did he have any defense against these charges? Absolutely. He, he said, no, well, I am not a murderer at all. I killed someone on his request, which is a own section under the German criminal code. Or it was assistance to suicide. And how did that go down in the court? What, what, what was the reaction when he, when he said that? It did not follow the prosecutor and it also did not follow Mavis' defense. So it was some sort in the middle. On the 30th of January 2004, Armin Mavis was charged with the manslaughter of Bernd Brandes. He was sentenced to eight and a half years in prison. Justice had been served. But neither Armin Maivis nor Germany were pleased with the result. Maivis saw his actions as killing on request, while Germany saw them as murder. The cannibal of Rottenburg would face justice once more. I'm investigating the world of cannibalism and the German criminal Armin Maivis. In 2001, Armin Maivis broke the last taboo he consumed another human being. The act of cannibalism on Bernd Brandes had been consensual. And in 2004, the German courts had found Maivis guilty of manslaughter. With no motive, they couldn't find him guilty of murder. But this was about to change. Maivis appealed because he did not feel that he had done anything wrong. We've got to enter his mind at that stage. We've got to see his uh, psychology, his reasoning, and his reasoning was that this man had come forward willingly, offered himself as a victim, and that he had died in the course of a sex act, and that sex act of cutting off his penis had led to him dying. So he didn't feel that he had done anything wrong. Crucially, though, what was being gradually realized by the German authorities was that this so-called consensual behavior actually masked uh, um, darker intents, 
Mivas didn't feel those darker intents would have led to a murder charge, which is why he wanted to appeal against the first sentence. On the 22nd of April 2005, the Court of Appeals reversed the judgment made in Castle. Armin Mivis had appealed, claiming the crime was a killing on request, but the German legal system wanted to convict him for murder. The retrial began on the 12th of January 2006 in Frankfurt. Prosecutors questioned the reason behind Brandes' death. What was Mivis' motive? Had he killed him as a way of satisfying his own sexual needs, rather than obliging Brandes in his request? Do you think Mavis' motive was sexual or, or something else? For Mavis, it was a sexual issue. He wanted to kill and slaughter somebody. He looked for somebody just for this purpose, and he played it through in his mind. He said after the killing, he'd watched the video from time to time and masturbated. That was his sexual fantasy. It was absolutely clear. The court brought to light the fact that Brandes was unable to make his own decisions on the evening of the 9th of March 2001 due to the amount of alcohol and drugs consumed. The pathologist, Manfred Riese, had also discovered, whilst watching the video of the slaughter, that Bernd Brandes was still breathing before Mivis began his butchery. The video proved that Brandes was still alive at the point his throat was cut. Before, he was breathing, he moved his head. After his throat was cut, he bled to death. That proves he was still alive at that moment, which Mivis has been denying repeatedly. During the trial, he said that he thought Brandis was dead. But why would you stab a dead person in the neck? Well, he realized that Brandis was still alive, and so he killed him. He left this badly injured man, who was getting closer and closer to his death in this horrendous house. He left him without attempting to help him. And then, well, he killed him, stabbing him in the neck, twice, on the left side of the neck. Armin Mivis was not phased by the justice system or the experience of being in court. He believed he'd done nothing wrong. Yeah. He presented himself well. He was a tall, slim man who could easily be taken as a bank employee or a post office employee or an employee of an insurance company, for example. He was extremely polite, friendly. He didn't show any sign of regret or concern about having killed a human being. No, he was convinced that he gave Bernd Brandes a nice death. He was proud of it. And for him, what he did was absolutely normal. Mivis laughed a lot, baring his teeth. And all of us saw it, and it gave us the creeps. We saw those teeth that he had bitten a human being with and that had eaten human flesh. On the 9th of May 2006, the court in Frankfurt convicted Armin Mivis for the murder of Bernd Brandes. His initial sentence of eight years and six months was changed to life. In Germany, that is a minimum of 15 years in prison. Mivis got life, but under European law, he believes he will one day, before too long, get out. Will he? I think Mivis will get out because of German law in relation to life sentences. Some European jurisdictions take a very different view of what a life sentence means from those of us in England and Wales take a view about what a life sentence will mean. For example, Anders Bering Breivik, the Norwegian who killed 77 people, the maximum sentence that you can receive in Norway is 21 years. So we're going to have to deal with the possibility that Anders Bering Breivik is going to get released. I often note that those murderers who will commit a sequence of crimes, often the first murder they commit, they're not very good at committing the murder. Because 
that murder has been their fantasy. And then suddenly it's made real, but they can't quite predict how things are going to go. So they develop a killing ability as the number of their victims increases. And all one sees in Mivas's killing of Bernd Brandis is Mivas learning how to be a master butcher. The case of Armin Mivas brought horror to Germany and the world. It provoked questions about the morality of cannibalism. When is it illegal? And when is it a necessity for survival? The big debate was about cannibalism not constituting an offence in Germany. It's not chargeable. It's not subject to prosecution. Cannibalism is one of the last taboos worldwide. It's the same as incest. And the taboo is but an act of our human development, of our human progress, of our human culture. That is the ongoing debate, which unfortunately hasn't concluded. There is no law in Germany which forbids cannibalism. There is only a law called the violation of grave. How much is the internet, do you feel, going to encourage more people like Armin Mivis? It is very worrying that the internet does provide the communication for these kind of criminal acts as it does for other more positive acts. And unfortunately, of course, when you have an infinite number of possibilities, uh, which you nearly have in the intercommunications in the internet, you have the potential that we may even not only see more crimes of cannibalism, we may see crimes of which we have not even conceived as yet. Armin Mivis will serve his life sentence in Castle Penitentiary, receiving therapy. He now spends his days working in the laundry and takes part in social therapy activities such as the church choir and art group. How do you feel about Armin now? I read about it in the newspapers, the things they write about Armin, what he's doing in prison and where he is now. Otherwise, I don't get worked up about it. If he comes back, then he'll be back. If he wants to move in again down there and renovate the place, or he wants to put a trailer outside, then he will live down there again. I don't mind at all. I don't need to be scared of him. I'm not afraid of Armin. I don't have to be afraid. But you could make up your own story if you have small children. Oh, the cannibal will come and get you. I think he is human, a tragic case. He has reached a certain type of fame because of his psychological disorder, but he'll never be able to lead a normal life. He'll never be able to have a normal relationship with a partner. He will never be able to have a romantic relationship with either a man or a woman, it doesn't matter. Because he will always have this idea in his head, I want to eat him or her. And that simply is not legal. He basically can only satisfy his sexual needs in an illegal way. And a person like that actually, I think, deserves empathy. Armin Mibis's consumption of burnt brandies broke the last taboo. Very few murder cases become truly international, but this one was so fascinating, horrific, and yet repulsive, it really caught the public's imagination. It also raises the intriguing question, is it murder or manslaughter when someone volunteers willingly? And how do the vague laws on cannibalism help or hinder the victim's and the perpetrators. Lieutenant Kenda has to find a dead woman's late night caller. Is he her killer? Brand new homicide hunter next. And tomorrow night, a missing stripper puts police on the trail of an ice cold killer. The brand new series starts at nine. Armin Mivas was a sexual sadist who found cannibalism the means by which he could express his sadism. Of all the horrific killings I've come across, Mivas is there right near the top. 
of all the killers because he actually got someone to sacrifice themselves, someone to be slaughtered and eaten. When I think of Armin Maivis, the slaughter, the, the killing and the whole case, it is unique and probably will never again be seen by a coroner. In December 2003, the trial of Armin Maivis sent shockwaves throughout Europe and around the world. The 42-year-old computer technician was accused of brutally killing and eating another man. But was it murder when the victim had apparently been a very willing volunteer? Maivis had broken the last taboo. I'm here in Germany to see how they dealt with the internationally famous horror story, The Cannibal of Rottenburg. I'm Fred Dynage and I'm investigating murders that have shocked the world. I want to know what motivates someone to kill and to find out how they think they can get away with it. To local villagers, Armin Maivis seemed the perfect neighbour. But how much do we know about what goes on behind closed doors? Armin Maivis was born in 1961 in Essen in West Germany. He was the third child of his mother, Waltraud, and the first child of her second husband. At the age of three, Armin's family bought a manor house here in the tiny hamlet of Wusterfeld, near to Rottenburg. It's a big place, 36 rooms, and it was bought as a retreat. It was in the heart of West Germany, and the locals here were to be horrified and confounded when, 36 years later, they realized what the young boy had done. Gisela Friedrichsen is a journalist on the respected German news magazine, Der Spiegel. She's been following this case very closely. Tell me about Armin Maivas as a child. He was the youngest of three sons. The two older sons left the family very quickly. So Armin Maivas remained the only person for his mother to focus all her attention on, especially her bitterness towards men. She directed everything at Armin. She monopolized the child. She called him Minchin. Minchin, which is a German girl's name. He had to do everything. He had to do household jobs, he had to go shopping, he had to take care of her. Wusterveld is a small village with only 25 inhabitants and there were few children. Neighbour Manfred Stuck remembers Armin Maivis as a young boy. Manfred, when did you first meet Armin? Da war ich noch kleiner Junge. I was just a small boy when Armin and his parents came to Wusterfeld. Armin's parents had bought a house in Wusterfeld, and that's how we met, because there were no other boys of the same age other than me. Armin had a horse, a white pony, and it was called Polly. During the Easter vacation, summer vacation here in Wusterfeld, he would go around with the carriage and the pony, and we would drive into the forest together with Armin, the pony, and the carriage. In September 1970, here in Wusterfeld, Armin Maivis's happy family life effectively ended. 